My guest today is Rob Richardson. Rob, how are you? Doing well. I'm so glad I get to join you today. Me too. What do you do for a living, Rob? I'm a developer advocate. My company right now is Shoreline. Shoreline makes it easy to focus on developer tasks rather than get bogged down by on-call things. So Shoreline makes it easy to automate those away. Very cool. That sounds like a fun job. It is. I get to travel quite a bit to conferences. I get to speak at events. We were at CodeMash together, which was really fun. And I'm on my way to Confu in Montreal later this month. Oh my gosh. I, I, I used to have that life and I kind of miss it. <laughs> <So> <laughs> yeah. Rare, Code, CodeMash was a rare treat for me. Um, yeah. And, and living in were, airports is cool and all. Yeah. I, mean, I don't like the airports as much, but the, the, I, they're a necessary evil to get to the place that I want to go. <laughs> yes, definitely. Uh, and you gave a talk at CodeMesh, or I think a talk and a workshop on um, uh, containers and Kubernetes and um, something about that, right? Yeah, I do a lot with Docker and Kubernetes with containers, teaching new users what the deal is. And, and so we got talking at CodeMesh, and it was really fun because we started wandering into exactly those conversations. You know, what's the big deal with containers? So I'm really excited where we get to kind of expand on that. Our conversation at CodeMash was really cool, but now we get to share it. I think that's oh. really awesome. Yeah, excellent. So let's start with, uh, before we start about what's cool about containers, what exactly is a container? A container is a mechanism for virtualization, and I'll compare it to virtual machines because that's probably what we're really familiar with. Virtual machines will virtualize the hardware. So inside my virtual machine, I'll specify the SCSI bus and I'll specify the RAM settings, and I'll specify the CPU type, and, and then I'll install the, the host operating system, or the guest operating system. And this virtual machine, then I can install my application and do all the things. It's pretty much a machine. We're virtualizing the hardware. By comparison with containers, we are virtualizing the operating system, the kernel. And so we don't need to install another operating system inside of our guest. Instead, we just use the operating system for our host. That makes it a whole lot easier to start up, a whole lot faster to start up, and it's really powered some really unique scenarios. Uh, we can start up a container whenever the request comes in, so we can use very little resources coming into it, and then whenever we need this, we can scale up to meet the capacity that we have, and then when we're done, the Elastic Cloud makes it possible for us to give those resources back and not pay for any, uh, pay for any content after the fact. So is this the big advantage of containers over virtual machines? Is that we can spin them up in a hurry and then just throw them away when we're done with them? That's one of the big ones is that they're so much lighter weight, they spin up so much more quickly. But the other part of containers is that they're ephemeral isomorphic deterministic hardware. Oh so my gosh, designed... that's a lot of big words. <laughs> yes. Ephemeral, isomorphic, and deterministic really are big words, but a lot of them, uh, the gist there is that they're the same every time, and they're meant to live for a short amount of time. So if I start up the container, and then I start up a second instance of the container, they're exactly the same in every way. If I started up two virtual machines, eh, are they gonna be the same? With virtual machines, we tend to keep the, uh, we tend to treat them more like pets. With containers, they're more like cattle, and we'll spin them up, we'll spin them down, they may live for a minute, they may live for an hour, but if I spin up a second one, it will get a distinct host name and IP address, but it's pretty much read-only hardware after that. So I can get two or three or five or 25 instances of my web server, and they will be identical in every way. Put those behind a load balancer, and now I have a durable website that runs virtualized without a whole lot of actual physical hardware. Interesting, so the, I think uh, I would use the word stateful versus stateless. VMs tend to be stateful, they remember information and if you shut them down and bring them back up again, it'll still have that information. Whereas containers, they tend to be stateless. You throw them away and it doesn't remember anything about themselves the next time they get recreated. Right, there are uh, definite uh, ways for we... making stateful containers just about to and ask stateless you. virtual machines but it's 
different. <laughs> well, how, how do we handle that? If we want, some, a lot of applications are stateful. We, we want to remember things. Uh, we want to store things in a database or store things on a file system. Can we do that with containers? Yeah. We definitely can. The technology in containers is called volumes. We can create this little spot on the drive somewhere, and maybe that's on our SAN, or maybe that's in Azure Files Storage, or S3, wherever we want to put these. And then we symlink that into a folder within our container. So the container, the running application, knows nothing about it. It just considers it to be another file on the drive. But if we read and write from there, it's no longer stored right there in the container, but rather it's redirected back to our durable file storage. And so that's how we can do durable, stateful containers, is we just map in a volume to where the data is actually stored. Got it. Um, now, I, I've worked with containers in the past, and usually I'm using some cloud service to store them in, like uh, uh, Azure or AWS. Is that Are containers just for the cloud, or is there use for them locally as well? That's actually what's really brilliant about containers, is that you can run them wherever you need to. You can run them in an on-premise uh, colo facility, or you can run them in a cloud native environment, or you can run them uh, locally on your development environment. And the cool part is that they'll run pretty much identically across all of those systems. So if you put your content in a container and then you move it to another environment, you may choose to inject configuration details through environment variables to make it run slightly differently, You know, use a different database, a different file store. But after that, the container is identical in every way. I don't need to recompile it for the new environment. I don't need to recopy all the files and make sure they're all laid out the same and, and futz with the configuration values. The container itself is deterministic. It's the same every time. I like that. It also tends to reduce this uh, problem. The, it works on my machine problem. It's <laughs> exactly. If the container is the same locally as it is in the cloud, then that's one less factor that's going to change as I move from one environment to another. Exactly. Now, one I, caveat there is that the container is virtualizing the operating system, the kernel. And so if we have a Linux-based kernel, then we need a Linux container. And if we have a Windows Server kernel, then we need a Windows container. And so we can't just run a Windows thing and then move it over into Kubernetes in the cloud and expect it to work just fine. Maybe, you know, we can definitely jigger it to have um, Windows hosts inside of Kubernetes in the cloud, but probably we're building Linux-based containers. And so even when we're running locally, we'll have a little vi Linux virtual machine and we'll run all of our Linux containers inside that. Then when we move it to the cloud, maybe it runs bare metal, maybe it runs on EC2 or other virtual machines, maybe we have a managed node through AKS. And so at that point, we're still running those Linux containers. We're now just maybe configuring them slightly differently. Uh, you Definitely. It works Linux. on my machine and it works on your machine uh -huh. too. Yeah, that sounds great. You mentioned Kubernetes a couple of times. What is that? Kubernetes is an example of a container orchestrator. And let me back up and tell you about container orchestrators, because Kubernetes isn't the only one. Let's imagine that we have a whole bunch of machines, and we'll pool them together, and we'll call this a cluster. Now, in this cluster, we can probably do a whole lot of things. We could run a lot of applications. We could load balance across them. We could create volumes, and we could create other things, maybe automated jobs. But I don't really want to manage all of that as a user. I just want to tell this orchestrator what to do and have it do it. So I may give an orchestrator a command like, I would like you to start my web server, keep it running, and have three instances of it across availability zones. And given that instruction, the orchestrator will then find the appropriate machine and start up the pod or the container on that machine. And so if I said three, then it'll start my container three times. And the cool part then is I don't need to tell it, well, start on this machine, or even if this machine has a problem, you know, maybe we want to run updates on the machine, so we take it out of the cluster, then Kubernetes will just notice that and move my workloads to a different spot that is available to me. The container orchestrator makes those decisions about where to run things and how to restart them and how to keep them running. 
And me, as an operator, I just tell it to do stuff, and I go back to sleep. I, I like that. Let uh, the, the orchestrator take care of the, the plumbing, the, the things that are sort of peripheral to, that is necessary, but peripheral to your application. Um, exactly. Tell me a little bit about the, the tools, the local development environment. You're working with containers and Docker and Kubernetes. What, what tools are you using to do that? Yeah, that's a great question. Kubernetes works great in production when I have that pool of machines and I want to run lots of applications at high scale and high durability. But locally, I may want to do different things. And that's where Docker is really helpful. Docker is the mechanism for building the containers and Kubernetes is the mechanism for running those containers at scale. So unfortunately, we start getting into arguments about, well, Docker is the old word, Kubernetes is the new word, let's only use Kubernetes and not Docker. But really, we use both of them together. Now, Docker is definitely not the only tool we can use to build containers, and Kubernetes is definitely not the only tool to run containers, but that's generally the way we use them. We'll install Docker Desktop or another build tool locally on our dev environment and on our DevOps pipeline build agents, and then we'll run Kubernetes or another container orchestrator in production. So once the containers get built, we'll push them into a container registry, and then Kubernetes can start up those containers when, it, when it's time to run that software. Uh, great, yeah, you brought up uh, DevOps. Uh, tell me, talk a little about that. How, how do we get these things deployed in a continuous integration, continuous deployment environment? Yeah, that's what's amazing about containers is that back in the olden days, we would have machines and we'd have to rack them and we'd have to get them set just so. And OK, now we hit some major event, you know, Black Friday or Super Bowl Sunday or something like that. And we need all the hardware. And then as soon as that event is done, then we don't need that much hardware. So they'll end up sitting idle. And if we're tr going to try to upgrade hardware, we need to log into each of our pets and we need to you know, pet it nicely and feed it and install our updates and install the new version and configure it just so. In the world of containers, it doesn't work like that at all. What's really elegant with containers is once we've built that container image, it's going to be exactly the same wherever we deploy it. So when we're starting to deploy new container image versions, we'll probably prop up a whole new environment. Hey, Kubernetes, can you start version two? So we'll start version two. We'll start all three instances of it. We now have two editions of our software running simultaneously. And then we'll slowly start migrating traffic over it. Let's send 10%. Is that working well? OK, let's send 20%. Is that working well? OK, let's send 50%. Is that working well? OK, let's send the rest. Once all of the traffic is over to version two, now we can shut off version one. We didn't upgrade it. We didn't do anything to uh, mess with that configuration. We just terminate those container instances once they're no longer needed. Because and that cattle, mechanism, they're not pets. Terminate them. Yes. That mechanism of just gently upgrading to new versions by propping up a whole new environment and then uh, spinning down the old one is really elegant. So then in the DevOps pipeline, well, what am I doing? It, typically in a DevOps pipeline, we're doing a whole lot of build and test things, and we'll do that here too. But ultimately, the build asset is not a whole bunch of DLLs or jar or war ear files. It's a container image. And that container image has not only our application software, but also any dependencies that we need. Do we need other packages installed on the machine? Do we need a PDF generator? Do we need uh, access to other resources, SDKs for maybe the AWS uh, SDK or S3 details, all of that is baked into this container. Mm -hmm. So now when I get ready to deploy it, it's much like powering on a brand new machine every time. But it starts up really fast, kind of like Excel starts up, rather than starting up a whole new Windows instance. Yeah, one of the issues with DevOps is um... Uh, source control. We manage source code inside of a source control repository. Um, how is that handled in the world of containers? I know they have a separate repository concept for containers. Yeah, definitely. I'll still keep my source code, my application source code, in probably a Git repository. And I'll version my assets there. If I change a line of my web server, I'm definitely going to commit that back to my Git repository. I'll probably also put my Docker file in there too. We haven't talked about Docker files yet, 
But Docker files are that configuration as code. It's that recipe of how to build a container. And it's just a simple text file. It just has instructions of install this Linux program, copy these build files, uh, run this tool. And so we might, for example, copy all of our source code into a container and then run the build command to get those assets. Now, by the way, we're building in a neutral environment inside this container. And once we get those build assets, now we've got that final image. Now here's where, unfortunately, we're misusing the term repository because so far when we've talked about source control repository, we've talked about a Git repository that's storing the history of my source code. But now we have a deployment repository, a Docker image repository that's gonna store those build assets. Now the cool part about a Docker image repository is it stores those binary blobs, those effectively machines along with all of the application and dependencies and it, all of the pieces there are stored in that Docker image repository. So that means if I download that image because it's you know, deterministic, it's the same every time, I can start up a new copy of that web server really easily. I have cloned that image. Now we use the term clone in Git to talk about, you know, I'm gonna copy all my source code. And here we're not talking about source code, we're talking about that binary blob that that content, that machine definition that gets us a started web server. So we have a Docker repository, an image repository that keeps all of our server versions. And we will also have a Git repository, maybe on GitHub, maybe on Bitbucket, that stores our application source code, together with the DevOps details like our build definition and our Docker file. Uh, this is a good start, I think, to this knowledge. I think we could go on and on. We've gone for days talking about uh, all, the, <laughs> all the features of containers and of Kubernetes and of the tooling around that. But I think that's a good kickstart. Uh, unless there's something that you think that is critical that we haven't covered. Oh, this is great. And so, you know, once you've kind of gotten comfortable with the concept of containers, we can definitely go a lot deeper. You know, we could get into the details of what is a Docker file, what is the Docker build mechanism, how do we deploy and start them in Kubernetes. But this kind of gets the feet wet. You know, our goal today was to talk about why containers, and I think we've done that. Where's a good place for people to go to get started learning about this technology? The really cool part is that Docker and Kubernetes are really well-established technologies, especially on Linux. And so just searching for tutorials will probably land you on a good spot. I've built a Kubernetes workshop, a Docker and Kubernetes workshop. Uh, it's on GitHub. And I can put the URL to that workshop in the show notes. Please but, send uh, if you... Go ahead. Oh, please send it to me, yes. Yeah, definitely. You can go to github.com slash Rob Rich and search for Kubernetes hands-on workshop. And the cool part about this workshop is it kind of gets your feet wet with Docker. And then over the course of this workshop, you'll also then use the image that you built in Docker to start it on Kubernetes. Excellent. I'm going to your GitHub repository right now. There you are. And there's your repositories. And <laughs> I, will, I will find it here. You've got a lot of them here, so it'll take me a while to find it. But I'll put a link in the show notes. Uh, where Perfect. are you speaking next, Rob? I'll be at Confu in February. In March, I'll be at Scale20x in Pasadena. In April, I'll be at GIDS in Bangalore, India. And oh, nice. in May, I'll be in, um, where am I going in May? Sorry. Some more international event. Yes. Um, I'll, in May, I'm at Techlahoma. I'm also at SDD London and also at IPC in Berlin. Oh, it sounds like an exciting bit of travel coming up here. Yes, it's so much fun. I love getting in front of audiences and being able to share with them really cool concepts. I love seeing the lights turn on as people start to learn about these things. And so it's so much fun to be able to learn and teach at conferences. I could not agree. I, I could not agree more. I, <laughs> totally agree. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you so much. I've, I've learned a lot today and you stay safe. Most definitely. I've had a lot of fun. Thanks for having me on. It's been fun today to spend time discussing tech. Knowledgey people are great friends to have.